Hello and welcome to A New and Ancient Story. This is a podcast, a series of conversations, interviews, and occasionally speeches dedicated to the transformation of self and society. The basic idea is that we are moving from a story of separation to a new story, new for the dominant culture at least, of interbeing. What that means will become apparent as you listen to this series. We explore things like technology, spirituality, agriculture, healing, economics, politics, ecology, relationships, education, I mean pretty much everything that is undergoing a transition today as our old story nears collapse. If you want to engage these ideas more deeply, you can come to our website, charleseisenstein.net. Hey everybody, Charles Eisenstein here with my friend Daniel Schmachtenberger. I would call him a non-institutional and non-institutionalized intellectual. I find that the uh, most interesting, generally speaking, the most interesting intellectuals and philosophers tend to be outside of academia these days. Maybe there are some exceptions, but I feel like, yeah, like Daniel's a kindred spirit because both of us have walked a path that wasn't prescribed and it's taken us both to places that were not on the map. At least that's that's how Daniel has landed on me, that he's gained insights and developed perspectives that are not on the menu, conventionally speaking. So yeah, I'm really excited to share some of those with you. We just recorded a podcast a couple of days ago for his podcast. And um, Daniel, you were such a uh, gracious and generous and skillful interviewer. I felt uh, really humbled by that. And I hope to be able to return the favor. So welcome to A New and Ancient Story. Thanks, Charles. It's fun being here with you. I'm looking forward to us getting to have this dialogue. Yeah. Maybe we could begin... By, I'll just say that you use certain vocabulary that is unfamiliar, and it took me a little while listening to you to really begin to understand what you were saying, um, talking about things like multipolar traps and existential crises, and, and uh, there's a, f- a few uh, non-rivalrous games, things like that. And I think that those will come up. And, and when they do come up, maybe we'll pause for explanation of those things. Mm-hmm. We had a plan to start about talking about the paperclip maximizer problem. Mm-hmm. And this, like, it's like this AI thing, but it has huge implications for the direction of civilization, even down to a deep philosophical level. So is it cool if we just start with that? Do you want to introduce that? Yeah. 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 So, um, some of the listeners have probably heard of the paperclip maximizer thought experiment for those who haven't to construct it briefly. I believe the term was first introduced or at least introduced to the public by a researcher named Nick Bostrom in a book called Superintelligence, where he was exploring the risks of artificial intelligence and there are many different AI risk scenarios. And one of the general ones is called a paperclip maximizer. And the idea is that we don't need in AI getting a um, sadistic will of its own uh, against us or even being applied to weapons to be problematic. The idea of the paperclip maximizer is you basically have some goal that you want to train an artificial intelligence system on to help optimize whatever that goal is. And, you know, when we look at being able to train an AI on a particular goal like winning chess or winning AlphaGo or something like that, we see that Uh, If they understand the boundaries of how they could optimize that, they get capable of things that humans couldn't do very quickly. And so let's say I have a factory and I produce whatever. And in this case, just for simplicity and silliness sake, I produce paper clips. And I train the AI system on the goal of maximizing the number of paper clips that I can produce um, and increasing the efficiency of my paper clip production. So first, it gets trained on the data sets of my entire supply chain and my whole manufacturing process, and it sees where there are inefficiencies in the manufacturing and the supply chain. It figures out how to tighten up those 
those inefficiencies and the business is just running better. And that's awesome. That could even seem like a good thing for the environment because of decreased inefficiencies and things like that. But if it continues to get more and more intelligent and actually as it gets more intelligent, it gets better at getting more intelligent. The key to the paperclip maximizer is that it does two things. It does whatever goal you train it on. Plus it gets better at its ability to do that goal. And it gets better with an exponential curve because as it gets smarter, it's also smarter at figuring out how to get smarter. So you have compounding returns on intelligence that are then all applied to doing whatever the thing is. So um, pretty soon it starts running out of substrate to make paper clips. And so it starts uh, looking at how to make paper clips from additional substrate. So it starts realizing it can use recycled metals, not just whatever the original metal was and trash and whatever. And of course, then it eventually runs out of that. And, and eventually it needs to use the stuff that humans need uh, to live for substrate. And then eventually needs to use the humans and then it turns the whole universe into paper clips. And the idea is that if you had something that is way more intelligent than us in terms of it's just strategic capacity to achieve a specified objective. It's a very narrow kind of intelligence we're talking about right now in terms of we're not saying that it's good at defining what is meaningful, but if an outcome has been defined and it has access to the, the data set of things that are connected to that outcome, it can do optimization better than we can. And it, as we try to learn how to deal with it, it's going to learn how to deal with us faster than we're going to learn how to deal with it, right? So the chess systems competing against human systems are getting better at beating us faster than we're getting better at learning what they do to adapt. And so we're getting more and more obsolete as chess players on a very fast curve. Well, this is what we're already applying AI to do. Like before we start to think about true general AI and we are already across many industries applying artificial intelligence to optimize fairly narrow metrics. And you know, a classic example is Facebook or social media of any kind, Google, whatever, but we'll take Facebook as a simple example, uh, trying to optimize the goal of time spent on site. How much time does a person spend on site? Because the more time on site means the more advertising revenue, and at the end of the day, it's a for-profit company that makes money and returns to shareholders by advertising revenue that's proportional to time on site. But it's there's an AI running its optimization of what makes my newsfeed as sticky as possible and what makes the notifications as engaging as possible to come back. So it finds out that there are certain things, and this is the same as the YouTube suggested views feed, um, finds out that there are certain things that I'm particularly uh, more likely to pay attention to, and it optimizes for those. Now it's not conscious, it doesn't care, this is just pure analytics, but it's effective, and so we'll see that my news feed is totally different than your news feed. And it's based on what is the most sticky addictive stuff for me possible. And it tends to be that if I get, it's probably going to be things that involve attractive people of the opposite gender and things that scare me, anger me, or create in-group, out-group dynamics because it's appealing to my limbic brain because if it was appealing to my rational brain, rationally, I'd say I need to get the fuck off Facebook and go get some work done. And so we see that just using Facebook as an example here, people who are on the left and people who are on the right of a political spectrum have been shown to increase the radicalization of their view because from using Facebook, not because Facebook has the goal to make them radical, but it simply has the goal to engage them more in the stuff that scares them and makes them angry and that they share because they're scared and angry is stickier and ends up being more viral. So we're like, oh, wow, the paperclip maximizer of Facebook or of YouTube videos that is simply trying to maximize time on site has as an externality the entire sense-making capacity of the world getting ruined, right? Like, and uh, individual lives getting worse in quality and relationships getting more messed up and changing social dynamics, right? That's a, that's a big deal. So we can see that paperclip maximizing is already happening with what we call machine learning, artificial intelligence. And the thing that Charles and I have discussed uh, previously, and I think we'll get into now, is that the idea of a paperclip maximizer in artificial intelligence, it's a thought experiment for the risks of artificial intelligence, but it's also then a thought experiment for how our civilization as a whole works, independent of artificial intelligence, which is if you have a some kind of system of intelligence that optimizes a particular goal, maybe at the expense of other goals, right, because it has a very particular goal, 
and it gets better at doing that, there are problems associated with that. If it's part of a complex system where those other things that it might harm to optimize something matter for the continuance of life and thriving. And so we've talked about what we call civilization as a whole in modern terms, and we can think of capitalism to start, but it's not just capitalism. It's capitalism as the center of kind of in-group, out-group competing against each other in a rivalrous way, game dynamics of which capitalism is kind of at the center, but nationalism and uh, all forms of power structures are there's, it's a kind of collective intelligence, not an artificial intelligence, but a collective intelligence that predisposes what all the humans do. And it gets smarter and better at doing what it does. And it happens to be reductive, meaning uh, moving things in the direction of particular simple metrics And so uh, I'll kind of take a break and see, Charles, where you want to go before building out the example. But the idea is that civilization as a whole right now has paperclip maximizing elements as a collective intelligence system that is the core of the issue that we have to address. Yeah. It brings up for me Lewis Mumford and his characterization of the mega machine, he called it, which basically he was saying, what was the first machine? in the sense of, of a industrial entity. And he said it was, it was the first builder civilizations where human beings were the components of this machine doing standardized jobs controlled by the uh, hierarch, by the pharaoh or, or whoever it was. And this allowed whoever was in control of this machine to perform godlike feats which was why the Pharaoh or whoever was given a semi-divine status. And he says the basic model of the machine already existed 5,000 years ago in the standardization of roles. And then what happened is eventually the human parts were replaced by mechanical parts so that one person now controlling a machine can perform godlike feats like moving at rapid rates of speed, flying through the air, communicating, um, instantaneously over vast distances and so forth. We're all gods now because we are at the helm of of a machine. And so, like, so the the machine of civilization could also be thought of as a computer or as an artificial intelligence because it definitely has an intelligence beyond that of any human being. It can solve problems that no one person could solve. And so then, then it's what you're saying is okay. So what are the imperatives of of this machine and gosh it sure looks like maximizing gdp or maximizing human dominion or uh producing more and more you know more stuff or whatever motives and incentives are built into the machine it's doing a better and better job at accomplishing those and yeah where is this going and how can we stop the world from turning into paper clips or money. Right. So let's let's explore the model applied to civilization in some detail. So if you think about a colony of ants or termites, you see that the colony as a whole has certain kinds of intelligence that the individual ants don't have. Right? None of the ants on their own know how to make a uh, ant mound of that type or underground labyrinths of that type. And yet the coordinated behavior of all of them has the capacity to do that. So we'd call this a collective intelligence. And it, rather than being centralized, that there is one consciousness of the uh, ant colony controlling everything, it's a decentralized, emergent collective intelligence, the way we generally think of it. And we can see m- many examples of that. So the thing that we're describing here today is that the The thing that we call civilization is a collective intelligence that is misfit for its ongoing continuation with itself, Mm -hmm. Uh, misfit for its ongoing continuation with life. It has kind of mathematically self-terminating processes built in, and we're getting close enough to the self-termination points that those can start to become eminent, so we'll, we'll look at those. So, for instance... Let's just take capitalism to begin with, and we'll expand it, because we're not going to say that communism wasn't this. It was, too. Capitalism was just the better version, which is why I got selected for. Um, So if we look at what capitalism is as a system of decentralized incentive, 
it, the incentive is controlling or influencing patterns of human behavior. If people can make money and survive doing a particular thing and they make less money and are less able to survive doing other things, then there is a incentive to do certain things. And if they can move beyond just surviving to actually getting ahead, there's more incentive to do the things that keep increasing their capacity because of all the things that money makes possible. And eventually those who are near the top of the money hierarchy want to continue to double down on whatever it is that increases the capacity to be there. So then you look at what the nature of incentive, fiscal incentive looks like, and we say, okay, well, I can't really get dollars for leaving whales alive in the ocean. It's not, I can't convert their life onto my balance sheet, but if I kill them, I can get dollars for that by selling the whale meat. And I can't get many dollars by leaving trees alive in an ecosystem, but as two by fours, I can sell them. And so in general, there's a movement towards extraction and commodification. Okay. So we see the nature of that movement. We see that maybe the largest block of global economics writ large, if we were to take all the things that make it up is the military industrial complex. So we see that war is super profitable and I can make a lot of money by doing that. We, we look at all the areas we see. So money ends up being a decentralized incentive system that orients everyone towards the things that can make more of it. And as we look at the evolution of kind of the economic system itself, we say, just like the paperclip maximizer gets better and better at being able to do its thing. We say, okay, well, originally humans were just, sharing resources in tribal settings, and then there was exchange between tribes, and then we can look at uh, early currencies, and then eventually fiat currencies, and then fractional reserve banking, and then high-speed trading on digital fractional reserve banking. That's very much like the curve of a paperclip maximizer that is getting better and better at being able to get all of the humans to do its bidding, and here's kind of the key way of thinking about it it doesn't have its own ability to be an actuator to do stuff in the world outside of getting humans to do this stuff. And so any human that does the bidding of capitalism, meaning converts more of nature into stuff that can be put on a balance sheet, um, and we're oversimplifying here, but to get the idea, we'll expand it in a moment. Anyone who does its bidding well will get more power within the system. Right? They get more money, which ends up meaning more influence, and then also more influence to continue to double down on their ability to keep having that influence. I get enough money, and I can actually start to make laws by paying lobbyists that support the government's ability to have me keep making that money or to even subsidize how I make the money, or I make enough money that I can start controlling the media to be able to control the collective opinion of all the other humans to support me continue to make the money. So there's this... Uh, as I do better in the system, I get more capable of doing more better in the system. So right, exactly, it's exactly parallel to the AI learning how to learn better and better. Right. And the humans, so the humans that basically do the bidding of the system get more power in it. The people who are at the top of the power hierarchy are the people who are uh, most perfectly aligned with the will of that system. And then you look at kind of what the will of that system, not from a anthropomorphic, but just from a behavioral disposition point of view is. And then the people who oppose the system, if they're actually effective at opposing the system, are a risk to those who are in power, and they will inherently have less power, so they get taken out of some form. And if you look at like famous people who got assassinated throughout history, they were pretty much all against the paperclip maximizer, and they mostly got taken out by people who were stewards of the paperclip maximizer at the time, the power system. Mm -hmm. And so the interesting thing is it's not like the pharaoh or the head of the big banks or the whatever is actually in charge. The key thing is that they are a symptom of a system that incentivizes people to do those behaviors. They are actually an emergent property. So it's like, are there sociopaths running the world? Yes, of course, there are sociopaths running the world. Um, because if you create a system where to get to the top of a power hierarchy, you have to beat lots of people in zero-sum win-lose games to get up, I have to actually be good at beating people at, good at and oriented to beating people at zero-sum win-lose games to get to the top, which will include lying and disinformation and externalizing harm and layoffs and whatever it has to involve. Mm -hmm. But you see, it, we have a system that attracts sociopathy and then conditions, rewards, and trains it. And whereas like living in a tribe, you would not do well as a sociopath. 
right? You do very badly. And so you don't have an evolutionary environment. We have a system where the very top of the power hierarchy is an evolutionary niche for those who are most abusive with power in those particular kinds of ways. But effectively abusive, meaning that they, they figure out how to game the system to support them continuing to do it. Um, so it's like, the, are there sociopaths running the world? Of course. Are there people who conspire against for their own goals against other people? Of course there are. And for every Watergate or Enron, there's a thousand that don't get publicly acknowledged. That doesn't mean every conspiracy theory is true. Most of them are gibberish, but a lot of them are true. But that's not the cause of the problems. It is a symptom of a system that incentivizes conspiring. If you incentivize something, it will happen, right? That's kind of the supply and demand dynamic of it. And at the heart of the supply and demand dynamic is not a particular good or service. It's get more power within the system. Yeah. So sociopathic traits are basically part of the job description for being in the elite. And if you don't enact those traits, then you will be squeezed out in one way or another. And somebody who is more sociopathic will step into those roles. And you're also saying that there are conspiracies, but the whole system itself isn't a conspiracy. It's not that an evil elite created the system and is running it in order to enslave everybody. It's that the system created the evil elite that operates its levers. So they're more like functionaries than puppet masters. Well, and then of course it's recursive, right? That's how the system works. It's, the deep learning system has a recursive element. So the people who get into the positions of power will then work to control, will work to influence public opinion and influence law to support them being in power. So do they do stuff that is directly harmful to the system writ large or, or to the commons at least? Yes, of course they do. And do they do stuff that increases their ability to keep doing that? Of course, that is what the system predisposition is. Well, that's not very cheerful, Daniel. I mean, it seems like, like they're, and they're getting better and better and better at it. Or are they? Like some of these things, they get exponentially better for a while, but then they, you know, level off and they reach an inherent limit. Like it looks like our civilization is doing that in a way, which is reflected in the slowdown in the rate of economic growth, um, the decreasing effectiveness of our technologies to solve basic problems. Like it doesn't look so exponential anymore. What, what do you think about that? Yeah. So if we think about the development of uh, the things we call civilizations historically, there will be some pioneering effort to go explore some new territory niche of some kind most of those don't work and they're expensive. And then the ones that do work become the basis of uh, a new development. And then you get a lot of development on whatever that thing is. Hey, now we're mining. Like we figured that thing out. Or now we've got this spot that's good. Or now we're working the plow here or whatever it is. And then you will start to get to a place where you get, um, you know, early people having captured much of the power system associated with those things, the pioneering landscape having not having open opportunities for new people to pioneer from scratch. And so then everybody else has to work for the people who already did the early pioneering in some kind of way. And so the first people who were doing whatever the thing was had a direct relationship with pioneering innovation with actually the natural world itself or with um, yeah, reality itself. And, then, and so they were able to get ahead through an innovative process. At a certain point, there's no more space to actually innovate or mm -hmm. come up with new stuff So on your own. So what you end up doing is working for the existing system. And now all those people are in a domestication system. And there is an upper limit on what they can do. And the only way they can get ahead is to climb that power hierarchy. So they go to work for... A company rather than the very few people who found the company and of course most of the companies fail when the founders do it they fail the few that make it and there's now a huge cash stream coming in then everybody goes to work there the people who work there are not going to have as much power as the people who founded it as time goes on it gets bigger even less so and at a certain point climbing that power hierarchy whether it's a government or a corporation or a whatever becomes my only way to get ahead more than doing fundamental 
innovation. And so I have to get better and better at figuring out how to win at power hierarchy kinds of stuff. And so if you look at the court of Versailles and Louis XIV and the courtier type dynamics, there was a world where everyone, like nobody was trying to make fundamentally new stuff or new innovation. There was no real pioneering space. Everyone was just trying to get more of the power somebody already had, uh, you know, bestowed right. on them. And this is what we call politics. And the things that give you power within an institution are not necessarily the same things that make the institution more effective, make the government work better, make the corporation make more money even. Like, so yeah. very, very often, uh, Actually, it's usually the opposite of that, right? So we, we can't do things that are so damaging to it that I damage my ability to get ahead. But I also don't need to optimize the organization. I have to optimize my own bonus structure within the organization. Um, I have to also optimize my ability to get away with the fact that optimizing my bonus structure is not optimizing the company. Mm -hmm. And so that looks like hiding transparency, like systems that decrease transparency and that decrease accountability. So we'll make a limited liability law that doesn't make me accountable to certain things will make certain kinds of corporate veils where nobody can even tell who's doing certain things. Well, you know, whatever. Right. And those basically those breakdowns of accountability and justice end up leading to, again, doubling down on the environmental niche where doing the more sociopathic thing actually is selected for. But I guess why I'm saying this is we see this interesting thing where, you know, in the last years and decades, there's a tremendous amount of new wealth that is not part of kind of older wealth systems because of a proliferation of software tech. And the people who do that are still part of the paperclip maximizer as a whole, but of a slightly different type. Someone who didn't come from the mindset of being at the top of a power hierarchy and mostly maintain their power hierarchy without actually innovating new novel goods or services or um, discovering new stuff. Basically that adaptive environment is pretty close to purely political, which is mostly sociopathic environment. The make new tech from scratch that can meet some good or service that can meet some need for someone is actually a more adaptive thing. So we can see that happening, which is cool. We can then also see though that that tech, even if it was created for an a positive intention at first, both has externalities like Facebook created hope, like we'll be generous and say for the purpose of connecting people socially, actually leading to much worse social connectivity and political polarization, radicalization and breakdown of sense making writ large. And that's because of its financial structure. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't optimizing for ad revenue, it wouldn't have to optimize for time on site. It could apply its capability to radically different things. Right. And the same is true with YouTube's algorithms. The same is true with all of these. So even if it starts for a positive purpose, it ends up becoming captured by the machine if it is to continue to be successful within this larger machine of capitalism. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's two things that I want to basically name that you've already described. I just want to make them explicit and see how they relate. Uh, one of them is this... I called it a mega machine, but civilization that's getting better and better at converting the world into money. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we have inefficiencies and dysfunctions within the machine that are incentivizing behavior that doesn't necessarily make the machine get better and better at converting the world to money because what serves someone's personal interest can actually make the, whether it's a corporation or the mega machine as a whole, less efficient. So. Does this mean that there is a light at the end of the tunnel, like a way out from a bleak future of the entire world gets turned into paperclips? Like, could we build an alternative or could we somehow take advantage of the built-in inefficiencies of organizations as we know them that are financially motivated to supplant the civilization with something better? Um, is there a solution? Yes, I propose so, and we'll get to it. Um, it's not from exploiting the inefficiencies because what makes a corporation inefficient or a country inefficient actually still serves the paperclip maximizer writ large because it just moves the center of power from that corporation 
from, you know, Microsoft to Google, mm -hmm. uh, from US to China or, you know, British Empire to US or whatever it is. And so the paperclip maximizer keeps doing quite well as the local parts rise and then collapse, rise and then collapse, but continue to whenever one part is uh, starting to collapse, all the adaptive things that learn just move to a new center. Uh -huh. um, there's a couple more ideas we have to construct okay. to get into the alternative because we we haven't specified the key of why this system works the way it does yet. Okay. Um, I'll be patient. So one thing, you know, you and I have uh, talked about this before, when we, to define what evolution is, not just in a biologic sense, but the, the deepest sense that complexity science gives us is that evolution is a increase in ordered complexity that leads in the direction of emergent properties and that what's being selected for emergent properties. So, you know, a, a cell respirates even though none of the molecules on their own that make up a cell respirate. It's an emergent property. And so there is advantage to those molecules being together from even a thermodynamic perspective that there isn't being apart. So we can say that biologic evolution is a special case of this larger principle by which subatomic particles come into atoms, into molecules, and to, that there is a process of increasing complexity but specifically complexity that doesn't have emergent property doesn't get selected for. So it's ordered complexity and in a certain way has emergent property. The emergent properties come from synergies. And so we can say evolution is defined by these kinds of synergies and increasing complexity. So we look at a biosphere and we see, we see the complexity of a single organism, like a cell that is really incomprehensible and or a tree, but then we look at the intercomplexities of all the cells in a tree or all the cells in an animal and then the relationships between the aerobic and the anaerobic bacteria and between the predator and the prey and between the gas exchanges and all the things like, wow, right? And, and it keeps increasing over time. Of course, you're going to have some species die off and new species come about, but we're, over time, you get an increase in the complexity of the species from single cell, you know, up to neurologies and then reptiles and mammals and primates and on and on, right? More complex nervous systems, more complex behavioral patterns. So the interesting thing there is we can, we can see that the paperclip maximizer has the exact opposite directional orientation as evolution does. Evolution is increasing the orderly complexity and in which automatically means that it increases the type of diversities in the system and the synergies between those diversities, right? So in an old growth forest, there's radical diversity and also radical synergy across all those diversities. And, the, and it's oriented to the continuation of both the diversity and the order, the agency and the communion, the individuality and the interconnectedness. Um, and the paperclip maximizer takes complex stuff and makes simple stuff out of it. And so if we think about that for a minute, we take the example of a tree in the forest. A tree in the forest is super complex. You know, if we ask, like, what is the value of a tree, we have to start by even saying value to whom, in whose perspective, who is the beneficiary of value. And we start to look at it and we're like, wow, pretty much everybody is a beneficiary of the value of the tree, but they're different kinds of value. The pollinators come get a certain thing and the birds that live in it get another thing and the squirrels that live in it get another thing and the fish that live in the river that is cleaner water because the topsoil was stabilized by the roots get another thing and the fungus in the soil that has the mycorrhizae that has a relationship with the roots is another thing. We're like, okay, and the, the sequestering of CO2 and the production of oxygen for the mammals. So the tree has a a kind of indefinite number of beneficiaries that it benefits with an indefinite number of different outputs, right? Mm -hmm. So this is like not optimizing for a single output to a single kind of beneficiary. It's, uh, you can't even call it optimizing actually. Um, but if you wanted to say that just loosely here, it's optimizing for synergetic benefit across this whole interconnected web of things. And so we take the tree and it's not worth anything economically to me, but if I cut it down and turn it into a two by four, now it's worth something economically. And the tree is self-organizing and self-healing. If I burn the forest, the forest will regrow, right? If I burn the house that I'm in made of two by fours, it doesn't regrow. If I burn the two by four, it doesn't regrow. And so I take something that is anti-fragile, that is resilient, 
and I turn it into something non-resilient and fragile. I take something that affects many beneficiaries and I try to capture it for one beneficiary. I take something with many value types and I try to turn it into one value type, right? So now I turn this very complex thing of a tree into a very simple thing called a two by four. And then I might build a complicated thing out of the simple things, a house. Complicated, different than complex. The tree self-organizes, the house doesn't self-organize. Make a blueprint, somebody builds it from the outside. The forest self-heals, the house doesn't self-heal. The forest evolves towards more increasing complexity. The house entropically breaks down in time. Yeah. So humans build complicated stuff. Complicated stuff is inherently fragile. Our, our laptops don't self-repair. They don't self-organize. Neither do our roads or our infrastructure or water systems or whatever. And so we convert the anti-fragile complexity of the natural world that evolution brought about into simple and then complicated fragile in entropic more than syntropic stuff which require top-down management because mm -hmm. they don't organically maintain themselves right i mean and maybe another example of it would be the imposition of monocultures cultural agricultural various kinds of monocultures on the world which yep. is reduction of uniqueness and complexity into something simple the ultimate of which would be the monoculture called money which is pure quantity Right, so say I take the yep. tree, I turn it into two by fours, and now I can accumulate a bunch of these two by fours. So I can build something out of it, but I can also trade them. But they're a little bit cumbersome to trade, actually. I can't, the liquidity is not high enough that I can just trade a bunch of them in a hurry if I want something else. So I actually don't even want to store the two by fours. I want to sell them right away and get money because even though the money has no actual value, it's purely representative value, meaning I can't build a house out of it or eat it or really anything. Um, because of its liquidity for other forms of value, it seems to maximize my choice, my freedom, my optionality. So I don't want trees. I want two by fours. And then I don't want two by fours. I want dollars. And then, because I can't spend a dollar on Amazon, I actually don't want dollars. I want bits, which is the digital dollar in an account that has maximum liquidity and its potential. And so we actually see each of those are a step towards more simplicity. Mm -hmm. And so now we have a world that wants to convert the natural world and human creativity and human labor and all of it into bits of a particular type that are abstractable, fungible, tradable, optimizable. That is exactly the opposite direction of evolution. It is decreasing orderly complexity. It is converting the anti-fragile natural world into an increasingly fragile built world and then we're trying to run exponentially more flow through an increasingly fragile system. So when we look at oil pipeline spills, we look at the fragility of the system that's trying to run more and more stuff through it. When we look at wars and economic collapse and environmental collapse, we're looking at breakdowns of fragile systems. But if we keep trying to convert the anti-fragility of the natural world into increasingly fragile world that we're trying to run exponentially more flux through, that self-terminates. Mm -hmm. process self-terminates but there the fiscal incentive is in that direction and again it doesn't take everyone like you could have a lot of people who are like man something matters more than money i don't want to do that but anyone does that thing and of course they might have a fiduciary responsibility to shareholders they might whatever it is anyone does the thing that continues in that direction and they gain so much more money which equals power which means adaptive advantage that everyone else has to justify continuing to do that or they lose in the economic competition by default. Now that's the concept you mentioned earlier called the multipolar trap. The multipolar trap is one term to be able to explain a scenario where you've got a lot of different agents that are in an assumed competitive relationship with each other. So the agent could just be individual people competing with other people or it could be tribes competing against each other or corporations or countries, right? But some agent that is acting for its own benefit. And these are the poles in the multipolar. Right. Okay. <clears throat> and so if any of the agents does something that is bad for the whole, bad for the commons over the long term, but that provides a lot of near-term advantage to them, there's a big incentive for them to do that. And if they do, then all the other agents in the system have to try and do that as well to not lose where that agent was getting ahead, or they do lose by default. So they basically, anyone exploiting such an opportunity creates a 
gradient for everyone else to race to exploit that opportunity. So the tragedy of the commons and the arms race are two classic examples. Mm -hmm. Tragedy of the commons is, okay, I don't want to fish all the fish out because I actually think fish are beautiful. I'm in a tribe or I, I love them. I want them to be there in the future. I don't want to cut down all the forests. I think forests are beautiful. I want to keep hunting in it. And I actually don't need that many trees. But if I only cut down the trees that I need, if our tribe only cuts down the trees we need and to leave the forest, the forest still isn't going to get left because the other tribe is going to go cut down the trees or some other tribe beyond that one is. So I don't even have the choice to protect the forest. So if it's going to be them cut down the trees or me cut down the trees, and if they cut them down, they're going to build weapons to attack me. They're going to build storage of resource to get through the famines. They're going to all those things. I have to go cut the trees down. Not only do I have to cut down more than I need and store it, I have to do it faster than they do because they are an assumed competitor. But they're thinking the same thing. They're only doing that because they assume I'm going to. So everyone is now in this situation where they assume somebody does the fucked up thing. And I'm like, well, we could make a treaty. Okay, so me and this other tribe and the other tribe close by all make a treaty that we only cut down X number of trees. Cool. But the other tribe is totally sucks and they won't join the treaty. And so they're going to do the fucked up thing. So we can't even keep the treaty. We all have to do the thing, right? So then we cut down all the trees and we actually race to go from axes to saws to chainsaws to whatever to cut down the trees as fast as possible to get there before the other guy. And this is why 80% of the old growth forests are gone. This is why 90% of the large fish species uh, populations are gone. The whales, the whatever else is because multipolar traps. So that's the tragedy of the commons example. And the arms race is if some, say somebody produces this new terrible weapon and nobody wants to live in the world with that terrible weapon because it's just worse for everybody. Everybody's more likely to die in terrible wars. But if anyone produces the new terrible weapon, everybody else has to produce the terrible weapon to be able to have any chance in war against them. Plus, they have to produce defenses and counter offenses to the terrible weapons. They have to increase total terrible weaponry in a lot of ways, right? And if they don't, they're just going to lose. So we saw that with nukes. We see that with AI weapons happening right now. We saw that with chemical weapons, biologic weapons. We saw that from the cannon, right? Like just the, the Bronze Age, the, the stone tools. And so... Here's how we define it. Where an agent can get ahead, independent of the well-being of other agents or the commons, and even at the expense of other agents or the commons. That's the rivalrous game theoretic environment. Rivalrous meaning I, I am both rivalrous with the commons and rivalrous with other agents. In that environment, my ability to exploit the commons faster than the other guys and find some new way to do it, in which case then all the other guys need to be racing to do that same exploitation with me, there's no way to bind that unless we try and create, the historically, the only way to bind that, what we call multipolar trap, is with some agreement, right? That's what the, um, can we make a treaty to not do it is, but how would we enforce that anyone keeps the agreement? Well, there has to then be some monopoly of force that is stronger than any of the agents that can say, hey, if you don't keep the agreement, we're going to put some force on you to push you back into it. So one of the main reasons we have created states, governments, is to bind multipolar traps. So you have some monopoly of force, meaning the police force that is backed up by the National Guard or the military force, whatever, that is backing up law, because law wouldn't be that thing without monopoly of force. So the idea now is we try and create laws to bind the multipolar traps. You can't cut down trees in the protected area, right, in the national forest or whatever it is. So we have an EPA or an FDA or an FTC or somebody to protect against some bad action backed up by a monopoly force. Now, and that's at a national level or a state level, but it can also be at an international level. That's the idea of what the UN is, right? The, that after World War I, we're like, oh, national governments on their own can't actually govern in a way that keeps them from wanting to blow the whole world up. And our technology is now so terrible that we can't have wars like this anymore. So can we create some supranational organization? That was the League of Nations. League of Nations obviously failed in its goal of preventing World War II. And so we changed the name, called it United Nations. And so the goal there was let's, let's do nuclear disarmament because now nuclear is the really big thing and let's prevent spread of nukes and the use of them. And we haven't had World War III formally kinetically yet, but we went from two countries having nukes to 19 or however many having nukes and nukes not even being the 
concerning thing. Now in the proliferation of exponential tech mediated weapons, everybody's got them, not even state actors. So we're like, okay, well, why is it that the top down force, the UN has a monopoly of force? Why can't it keep the nations in check? Well, because the nations have too much power for the UN to have a monopoly of force over them. So say you're a country with nukes and we're trying to do nuclear deproliferation. We say, okay, you're going to, you're going to give up your last nuke now. You're like, no, I'm not. That's fucking stupid. I give up my last nuke and somebody's going to come invade me who has nukes. And so you'll lie and say this is your last nuke while stockpiling some other ones, right? And then not agree to the inspections or whatever it is. Um, and because you assume that whoever else is giving up their last nuke is also lying and stockpiling some. And so this is the multipolar trap thing, right? And so then if the UN, so nobody wants to volunteer to give it up. So then can the UN force and say, we're going to force you to give up your last nuke. They're like, no, fuck off. We have nukes. You're not, you can't do that. So multipolar traps from bottom up dynamics, market style dynamics can't be bound by the market um, or countries competing by each other can't be bound by the country. They can't be bound at their own level and top down forces can only bind them when there is a monopoly of force and that is oriented to bind them. And at this point, because of exponential tech, there can never be a monopoly of force in the same way there was previously um, because the bottom-up forces are too powerful to be overrid in that way. And so we say, oh, all right, so now we have this place where we have multipolar traps of all kinds. Right now it's build AI as fast as you can for all purposes that there's incentive for, including weapons, right? Or things like that. And if anyone makes a law that tries to protect against something like an environmental destruction, whoever has the economic interest to do that environmental destruction has the economic incentive to pay lots of lobbyists to change the law and to hide that under some other thing that doesn't seem to make any sense that nobody pays attention to and to pay for campaign budgets and to you know, all those types of things. So we end up seeing that law falls to economic incentive when it's, even though it's supposed to bind economic incentive, the problems of it, because economics is actually deeper in the stack of power than law and government is. Yeah. Quite a few things in there. You're basically establishing uh, one pillar after another, after another of um, an argument that I think you're going to continue developing. I'll just add like maybe, a supporting comment. I, I read a little bit about the actual tragedy of the commons. The textbook example was villagers grazing their sheep, and it's to the advantage of any one villager to graze them as much as possible so that his herd increases. But if everybody does that, then the pasture gets overgrazed and everybody's sheep die. But no, it's to nobody's interest to rein themselves in. Mm -hmm. Historically, however, according to what I read, uh, that didn't happen because the community had explicit and implicit agreements, social pressure. If you were grazing too many sheep, then people would make life difficult for you and you would feel shame. And so people actually got along quite well and didn't destroy their commons until market economics and the idea of the separate individual came in and introduced that logic and weakened the informal ways that people regulated the use of the commons. And when that happened, then the imposition of force by a state became necessary. So it was kind of a substitute for... Right. Yeah. Okay, so this is a super important example. When we say that there's a top-down force that binds the bottom-up one that has monopoly of force, monopoly of force in the way we think about it today is um, a actual police force or military force that is asymmetric to the physical rebellion capacity of a subset of the population. Now, there was something that you could think of as a kind of monopoly of influence before state type dynamics that weren't just mediated by those type of police forces. And it was what you're describing, right? In a community, if someone starts to behave in a poor way, being ostracized from the community, right? Like being shamed or being excluded or people not wanting to interact with you, you're, you can no longer do it. You can't actually get ahead or survive if you can't interact with people. And so uh, that was actually able to work 
at a fairly small number of total people where there was transparency to the dynamics, right? So there's only three sheep herders that can be letting that grazing happen. And anyone who's doing the thing, everybody can see. So remember how we said when there is a breakdown of transparency or a breakdown of accountability, you create the environmental niche for the bad actor. So as we get to larger sizes, everybody can't see what everybody's doing and it becomes easier and easier to obscure this which is then where you have to try and say, okay, well, can we make government bodies that can do investigation and that kind of thing? So if you think about like, if I, if I'm in a big corporation, nobody, no one's really watching what I'm doing um, in the same way that they would be in a tribe. And particularly the only other people who will be watching that closely might have somewhat, I can coordinate it that they might have somewhat aligned interests but it's not like the actual end users that we're making products for that are on the other side of the world have any idea what i'm doing and or right. have there, any, might, there might be some accountability within the corporation to make sure you're not embezzling funds or something like that yeah that, you know but that only keeps you acting in the interests of the corporation not in the interests of the other the other stakeholders the, the corporation there. Yeah. With. right and so this is actually really important. For most of human history, we had people inside of families, inside of extended families, inside of communities, inside of groups of communities. And there was, um, there was organization that happened at each of those levels. And it's kind of like cells inside of a tissue, inside of organs, inside of organ systems, inside of a body. It's not just like 50 trillion cells inside of your body with no substructured organization. It wouldn't work at all. But right now, the family doesn't actually provision resources all that much. Families become a largely broken thing, especially the extended family. And the families were actually very good at provisioning resources, having an inner investedness in each other that wasn't game theoretic, and knowing what each other needed, having enough awareness that if someone had resources, they could provision within the family. And communities, tribes were also pretty good at those types of issues because you could actually see what was going on and they could be inter-invested in each other. And now you mostly have the individual interacting with the market and the state, right? The, the big giant everything that is impersonal and the individual as a voter consumer, producer. And that system is, necess is definitely broken. Right. So the problem isn't so much that there are too many people or that the scale of society is too big. It's more that there aren't enough coherent intermediary structures. Like you can imagine having a community where it's small enough that people usually regulate each other's behavior and you're not going to graze your sheep too much because then the blacksmith isn't going to help you and the, and the herbalist won't treat your kids. And so, and then you can imagine having the community um, interacting with other communities in a similar way, where if one community doesn't behave well, then the other ones, assuming that they're interdependent enough, the other ones don't provide it with something it needs. And then you could have right. groups of a community of groups of communities, and then a community of a community of com groups of communities. And you could imagine a planet operating on that level, which right. would be a complex, organic structure rather than a disintermediated world where you'd have an undifferentiated mass of people and a hierarchical control structure in the model of industry, which is all about the standardization of parts, the standardization of inputs and outputs and so forth. So maybe is where you're going with this, like some kind of successor to the industrial model of organizing society? Um, so. So let's look at complex systems that evolved and have uh, orientation towards increasing evolution and anti-fragility and like that. So there's a couple key principles that we see that are important here. Let's say we look at the 50 trillion, give or take, cells in a body. Which cells kind of run the show is a silly question. There are no few cells that are elected representatives or dictators or whatever. Which cells have really asymmetric power over all the other cells? There are none. none. And that was a delusion of, 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 of physiologists. I mean, they, people thought that, well, the brain must be in charge, but it's totally not like yeah. that. Yeah, right. The cells in a Petri dish will continue to do their own thing 
from liver cells or kidney cells or fat cells, or they are self-regulating in a bottom-up way. There are top-down effects where the neuroendocrine system is gathering big picture messages and then communicating big picture information back for coordination, but the coordination is not just happening at a bottom-up cellular and top-down whole system level. There's coordination happening at the level of a tissue. And there's coordination happening at the level of an organ and at an organ system. So there is something that is neither bottom up nor top down. And where the, the bottom up influences cascade all the way up to this emergent top thing, the top down influences come in turn affect the bottom up ones, but it's happening at all these layers and there's a kind of coherence phenomena. And so this is neither market nor government. This is something much, much more interesting and much more complex. But you see that at the level of a cell, there's a symmetry of power where all the cells, they're all doing their thing, but none of them have asymmetric power over any of the other cells. And you can think about, as far as messaging goes, cells are capable of sharing messages to other cells that they have a particular relationship with, mostly adjacent cells, right? We can see some effects where it'll be an endocrine effect, but it's still going to be things of a particular receptor type that it evolved to have that relationship with. So, why that is important, let's say a cell becomes a cancer cell. This happens all the time to some degree just because of mutation, oxidation, whatever that occurs. The job of the body is that to prevent the kind of carcinogenesis that makes cancer cells to make it much less common. But when it does happen, to actually convert the cancer cells back to healthy cells. And if it can't, then it has to kill them so they don't spread. Uh, kill the whole body, because then they're acting in a way where their own interest is pit against the interest of everything else, unlike healthy cells. And healthy cells, you know, liver cells are not competing with kidney cells to accumulate more of the scarce resource. And liver and kidney writ large are not competing in that way, right? The bones will move calcium they're holding into the blood for pH buffering or into the brain for calcium ion dynamics and then move them back in for storage. And there's this very complex provisioning that is optimizing the well-being of the whole system across every kind of metric. Um, but imagine that one cell became cancerous and it had the ability to broadcast its cancer signals, its cancer genes to every other cell simultaneously. And they would be uptaken because they, ha they hit some kind of um, addictive gradient or near term advantage gradient. Well, everybody would die of cancer very, very quickly. And so it's important that they're only able to affect nearby ones and the nearby ones exert a restorative force on that one. And so it actually requires the cancer is going to grow somewhat slowly. The body has a lot of opportunity to deal with it. This is the only reason we're not all dying of cancer all the time. And so today though, when you look at what broadcast media is, or you look at just asymmetric power of any kind, well, what is the asymmetric power of a, a Putin or a Trump in terms of kinetic warfare compared to you or me, right? It's, it's trillions of times. What is the asymmetric fiscal power of a Gates or a Bezos compared to us? What is the asymmetric messaging capacity of a top celebrity, right, in comparison? And so we look at the tools that are mediating that kind of asymmetry. So broadcast messaging is a good example. I can transmit a meme that will catch on because it has certain stickiness or limbic hijack dynamics, but it's actually a bad meme. It moves things in the wrong direction, but I can broadcast it to everybody. And there's no check mechanisms to see that that was actually a good meme that was adapted for the whole. That's actually super destructive, and super dangerous. And you say, can we have anti-fragility in the presence of any agent becoming maladaptive and being able to influence the whole asymmetrically. Nope. And so now we come back to the example of if I was in a family, in an extended family, in a tribe, in a, and I started doing something that was maladaptive for the tribe, there would be a pressure that sought to make me healthy. And first it would see it pretty early and sought to make me healthier before I had the ability to influence everything. Um, this is an important thing that's missing. And so when we start to think about extending asymmetric influence technologies and where an individual or a small group can influence the whole thing too much, which exponential tech does. Exponential tech means I have exponentially bigger levers to make choices with, meaning more impact from my choice, but nothing ensuring exponentially better choice making and better in a good for the whole, not just a game theoretic get ahead at the expense of everybody else choice making. That equation itself, exponentially more powerful choices without exponentially better choices, is also a fundamental 
problem, right? So we need to say, how do we get good choice making to scale faster than the power of our choice making? <laughs> this, this is like a fundamental thing that we're looking at here. But so let's say we extend exponential technologies the next several years and we say, okay, so CRISPR, biotech, gene drives, making it to where more and more people can do really fucked up things on smaller and smaller scales, the ability to do cyber warfare, AI, nanotech, whatever, these types of things. Because as we see with exponential tech, it doesn't just make exponentially more power, it also makes the power cheaper, right? We look at the cost of computation or any of these things, which also means then more decentralized. So it's not only state actors, it's non-state actors, it's smaller and smaller groups having more and more power. And that's like having each cell, if it mutates, have the ability to affect the whole system too rapidly. So there is no possibility for anti-fragility, for resilience in that particular structure. So if you ask people who study existential risk, like exponential tech mediate existential risk, how do we avoid blowing ourselves up from stuff that people are doing in their basement with no exotic materials that nobody can tell? Uh, a very common answer is ubiquitous surveillance. Universal surveillance everywhere. Nobody can be doing anything in there. And again, we said it's when there's a lack of transparency that a lot of these problems start to happen so that we can see why someone would say that, right? Is we don't want somebody in their basement being able to build CRISPR weapons. That's a bad idea. And yet we also don't want 1984. And if we have a surveillance state where the state is there is a structure that guarantees that the state is going to move towards corruption because that's how top-down power hierarchies work. And you have a power hierarchy of one-to-many power structure. The state has surveillance on everybody. Everybody doesn't have an input back to that, and it's oriented to be captured and corrupted. All right, that's a, so that's a failed system. But not having that seems like a failed system in the presence of exponential text. It's like, what? What the, what the fuck do we do? So... You know, you can see that even with the technology, the killing technology of in guns as opposed to knives, you just can't kill as many people with a knife if you get if you go wacky, right? So when you look at mass shootings, whenever we hear that somebody took an AR-15 and went and shot up a bunch of people and the news reporters go and do the investigation, the neighbors all say, yeah, he was real quiet. He kept to himself. We never heard from him, et cetera. And what that means is that person might have been progressing as a cancer cell, right? They might have been progressing in their own psychopathology, depression and upset for years with no one actually engaging with them to be able to see that. They could go to the store, buy food, and no one noticed if they were upset or not or healthy or not in the way that they would in a tribal dynamic. If you have people who can isolate themselves, progress in their psychopathology, not be checked, and they have AR-15s, you're going to have those kind of shootings. If they have access to progress in those types of isolated dynamics and they have worse weapons, it gets worse. So what do you do? Well, you don't have to have sur surveillance by the top-down state. Remember, there's a top-down force that happens not at the level of the whole body to a cell, but even a tissue to a cell. And so this is like, if that person was part of a family and part of a tribe where they actually needed each other, they couldn't just use this abstraction called money to get their needs met without having to interact with humans in any meaningful way, the other people would see, hey, this person doesn't seem well. Let's spend more time with them and work with them and help them be healthier. So this is a kind of surveillance, but it's not a top-down captured surveillance. It's a many-to-many -many rather than a one-to-many kind of system. So there's a symmetry in it. And this is a how do we have more awareness of what's going on for everyone so that we can help people actually be healthy. This is not sufficient for, but it's necessary for having choice making be the, our choice making basis be capable of holding our choice making power. Yeah. I've been thinking about this for a long time in phrasing a little bit differently, but, but how do we restore community? when we have a system that strip mines community because community is based on it's not just people knowing each other but it's people depending on each other so the economy as we know it replaces interdependency with dependency on distant abstract institutions and anonymous service providers mediated by a very complicated division of labor when when production is on such 
a vast scale and requires such a fine division of labor, how can you have meaningful community when all of our needs, our tangible needs at least, are sourced from afar? And Cannot. Yeah. So, have to fix so, that. <laughs> right. So, so one, one avenue is to relocalize and replace some of the functions that we've handed over to a global mega machine with locally met needs. And there's already a movement in this direction. For example, the food movement. People are wanting to source their food locally, but the economic system is stacked against that because of externalized costs, mostly. So lettuce shipped from California to the East Coast is cheaper than lettuce grown here uh, because of the subsidization, the perverse subsidies embodied in roads, for example, um, and, and the external environmental costs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So from what you said, the people who wield power aren't going to change those conditions because they are part of the paperclip maximizer. I mean, they are, their job is to maintain those conditions from right. which they personally benefit, but also the paperclip maximizer benefits in his production of paperclips. So, and it seems that the system has only strengthened its grip over the course of my lifetime and, I mean, forever. So it looks like a really bleak picture you're painting here. Like, yeah, we know what the solution would be to restore connection to, to each other, to place, to community, so that we can have informal, bottom-up, organic surveillance, or you could say transparency, so that we can identify the cancer cell before it starts shooting its cancer messages out to the entire world, before one Unabomber in his basement with a you know, genetic engineering CRISPR technology is able to unleash something horrible. Uh, we know what we have right now. We have a rivalrous system that compels everybody in it toward, to enact behavior that is going to destroy everything. And we know where we want to go, which would be to a society organized much more like a body with multiple levels of complex structure interacting with each other and enabling us to be transparent to the people around us in this kind of nested system that is non-hierarchical, that has uh, an interplay of bottom-down bottom, bottom down and uh, bottom-up and top-down dynamics that evolves toward greater and greater complexity. We know where we are. We know where we're going. Do you have like, at least like a little, uh, a little through line from here to there? Like, how do we take a step into this transition? Yeah. The heart of the problem is the word that you mentioned a couple times is power. And what we're talking about is a system where the primary concept is not power. Power meaning power over or power against in a rivalrous way, in a game theoretic way, where the core idea is resiliency. We could think of, we could use different terms, resiliency, strength, whatever, where the goal is not to maximize my power over the environment or other agents. It's to maximize my sovereignty and my ability, which includes my ability to not be controlled by other agents, right? To be anti-fragile to power without actually engaging in the game of power. It's a fundamentally different and kind of critical distinction because the game of power is actually the paperclip maximizer and capitalism is simply a part of it. And this is the key thing for us to construct so we can show what the alternative looks like. A lot of people are going to maybe be thinking, um, Daniel, it seems like you missed biology class and uh, don't understand how Darwinian evolution works and that uh, these type of rivalrous behaviors are nature itself and we evolved to have these kind of rivalrous dynamics and you're asking for something that is outside of human nature or outside of nature itself. This is an important point to address because I can't offer what an alternative is if people think that it goes against what is actually possible. And something that we need to understand in terms of the nature of this situation we're in is that if we look at 
ecosystem, natural systems, came about through evolutionary process, there are rivalrous dynamics. There's also heaps of symbiotic dynamics, and there's a lot more symbiotic dynamics than there are rivalrous ones. Um, but there are rivalrous ones, and they're worth pointing out. But even the rivalrous dynamics end up driving symbiotic dynamics at a higher level, and this is a key part that we have to understand, and we have kind of understood it. We've based our theory of markets on this idea. So, you know, the key example is we look at competition in terms of uh, various animals of the same species competing for reproductive opportunity, and obviously predator-prey relationships being directly rivalrous. There's plenty of things that look zero-sum, and so we look at a fox chasing a rabbit. And if the rabbit, if the fox catches the rabbit, the rabbit's dead. So that's pretty clearly rivalrous. If the rabbit gets away, the fox might actually starve to death or not be able to feed its kids. So there's a very clearly rivalrous dynamic. But we see that the foxes as a whole species and the rabbits as a whole species actually depend upon each other. They couldn't even really survive without each other, and they're driving each other's evolution. Because the slowest rabbits get eaten, the slowest foxes starve and don't, uh, don't mate, the fastest of both get through, and then those genes reselect. And so rabbits are evolving and foxes are evolving because of each other. And if it weren't for the rabbits, the foxes would have nothing to eat. And if it wasn't for the foxes, the rabbits would eat themselves to extinction. So we say, oh, this is actually very interesting. At one-on-one -on -one interactions, there's a rivalrous dynamic but it leads to a macro symbiosis. So how is it that micro rivalry becomes macro symbiosis? And the key insight there is that there is a symmetry of power between the fox and the rabbit, between the lion and the gazelle, between the shark and the tuna, between the, all these places where the prey gets away as often as it gets caught and, or more often, whatever the particular symmetry is, but there is a, there is actually a power symmetry that has it to where that dynamic between them doesn't have one get asymmetrically ahead of the other one. So they both co-evolve as a result of that process. But we could imagine if the foxes had a mutation where they got a hundred times faster in one generation, that they would eat all the rabbits, their population would boom, and then they'd all starve to death. So breaking the symmetry of power would actually break how evolution works. But the symmetry of power is never broken in evolution because what leads to right, natural selection, mutation, and then selection of the adaptive mutations, both survival selection and um, sexual selection, that happens the same everywhere, right? There's a distribution of what creates the mutation dynamics, and so um, there, the symmetry of power is maintained as the whole system steps up until technology came about. And with early humans, Homo habilis, Double Down, and Homo sapien, was the beginning of a creative process that was different than anything that had happened in the evolutionary process up to that point, where we were able to increase our power not through the same kind of slow mutation process that was increasing it on all sides in a way that actually broke the symmetry of power. So we could make stone tools and we could go hunt and we became radically more lethal, became better predators faster than the environment could adapt to our increased predative capacity. And so we could overhunt a whole environment. And then not only did our tool making capacity allow us to do that, it also allowed us to put on a skin and move into an environment that we hadn't adapted to. So we could go to the Arctic like polar bears and the savanna like cheetahs and the like we could go everywhere and become the peak predator in every environment. That's a fundamentally different deal because Micro rivalry leads to macro symbiosis only if there's a power symmetry. If the power symmetry is broken, micro rivalry leads to macro rivalry without bind and ends up self terminating. And so, if we take evolutionary rivalrous dynamics and multiply them by technology, which creates increasing asymmetry and eventually exponential technology, you do get an unstable system, an unstable oscillator that eventually breaks down. So because of our technology, the, the social Darwinist idea that markets are basically a Darwinian evolution process where different companies will create mutation on the same product and the one that people like will get selected via supply and demand dynamics, um, the idea actually doesn't hold in the same way because we do have the ability to outstrip environments faster than they can reproduce themselves kill whole species, whatever. And if we are debasing the substrate upon which we depend, then we're self-terminating. 
And that's how this is happening. So our tool making has given us enough power that rivalrous dynamics are unsustainable. This is the key thing that I'm wanting to share. Rivalrous dynamics where they occur are actually sustainable where there's a symmetry of power. But we have a radical asymmetry between humans and other humans and between humans and the rest of the ecosystem. In nature, there's a symmetry between lions and lions, right? The, in competing for reproductive opportunity, no lion is a thousand X more powerful than another lion and between the lions and the gazelles. Right now, we've broken it to where the human to human and the human to nature asymmetries are many orders of magnitude. So we have to figure out anti-rivalrous relationships with each other that can hold that technological power with each other and with the ecosystem, or we actually self-terminate. And this is the key thing. In the presence of exponential tech, and even before exponential tech, right? Like we started desertification thousands of years ago. We started extincting species a long time ago or overhunting environments. And we also started larger scale warfares than any other animal was capable of having as our technology got bigger. It's, and so whole civilizations have collapsed for these reasons. It's just we have a totally globalized civilization for the first time where the scope of this is much larger. The degree of power we have necessitates an evolutionary change like a fundamental change to evolutionary process itself where we can't model ourselves as apex predators anymore, where, you know, a great white shark can kill one tuna at a time. We can use an, a super trawler with a mile long drift net and kill all the tuna. Like they, you can't model yourself as an apex predator with that kind of asymmetric technological power. When you have the ability to destroy whole ecosystems, make whole new environments, genetically engineer new, new species, you have to model yourself as, nature itself, which is the only thing that has had that power previously, and recognize that if we're moving in the direction of increasing simplicity, the paperclip maximizer direction, that is a self-terminating direction. If nature is moving in the direction of increasing orderly complexity, and we're powerful enough to affect all of nature, we have to actually be stewards of the increasing orderly complexity of the whole system. So we move to mm -hmm. from just being parts of the whole competing with each other with broken power symmetries to saying, okay, the level of power we have, we've kind of got the power of gods. We have to have the wisdom and love of gods to be able to steward that. That's a way of thinking about the transition where it is unconscious evolution of the whole, right? Natural selection is kind of this evolutionary process that we don't think of as conscious. Then tool making is a conscious process, but it's just parts, right? It, in rivalrous relationship with each other. The next part is conscious evolution of the whole, which is really this kind of new epoch phase. And that is a fundamentally different relationship to not only power, but even identity. And this is where you come to why we need a new story and a new mythos where, where there is no way of thinking about me, my race, my nation, independent of all the other people and independent of the ecosystem because I actually don't exist without them. I can't. And my rivalrous dynamics with them will lead to their increased rivalrous dynamics lead to the self-termination of the whole. So when you ask, how does it transition? I don't know that we have the time to get into what is a new method of collective sense-making and collective choice-making and provisioning of resources that replaces what we think of as economics and governance now. And how do we do tool-making in a way that doesn't cause externality but culture actually has to be the first part of the transition because our new social systems, our new economic systems are going to require new types of tool making that mediate them in the same way that it's like you can't do cryptocurrency as an economic system without a computational infrastructure for it. And you can't have stores of grain that lead to capitalism or that, that lead to private ownership in that way before you have plows there are tools that mediate the new type of social agreements. We're going to have new methods of sense-making, largely because we also have new methods of communication and information processing and computational infrastructure and whatever. But how to even build the tools that are oriented to that as opposed to oriented to some other purpose will be some subsets of the population that have a new story, a new value system that then build tools that can be in service of that, that then build social systems where then people's participation with that social system recursively reconditions that underlying value system. And it's a movement from separate competitive self to interconnected symbiotic self from us as modeling ourselves as competing for apex predator status to stewards of the whole system 
where rather than humans compete against humans using better technology to exploit nature, it's nature gives rise to humans, humans gives rise to technology, so to be sustainable, technology has to in turn be in service to the resilience of nature. And this is, I mean, this is why I'm happy to be here talking with you, and I think this is the core of your work and why you have started with narrative and myth is there have to be people that are oriented to a model of what healthy civilization could even mean in the presence of the kinds of things we face to be working towards building things that make such a possibility come about where then the increased adaptiveness of that new system becomes the strange attractor. Yeah. What you're saying is, is so, so closely congruent to the things I've been saying for years um, with totally different language. I, I speak, for example, of a transition from a relationship of mother earth to a relationship of lover earth mm -hmm. where we no longer just uh, are feel at liberty to take and take and take as best we can, which is the proper relationship of a child to a parent. Um, mm -hmm. but, but where we understand that we are here to give and take in, um, in harmonious measure and perhaps to, as with a lover to co-create something together. So that really does translate into abandoning the behavior of an apex predator and taking responsibility for the effects of our actions on the other. It also means uh, a reconception of who we are in relationship to the other, in relationship to nature. It's a change that goes all the way to the bottom. Yeah, all the way to what we believe we are, what we believe reality is, and the relationship between us and reality. Because right. what we understand to be real is going to inform what we understand to be meaningful that is the basis for then what we are making choices and service to. Right. Um, yeah, I see it as really an initiation mm -hmm. into a different collective state of being that also then induces a different personal state of being. Because one hallmark of an initiation is that you're faced with circumstances that, that none of your existing tools are sufficient to handle. Right. And you're, you're then forced or at least strongly invited to uh, metamorphosize, you know, to grow and to, to become something else. I mean, I'm not going to say that it's entirely new. I think that at each stage of human evolution, like with the advent of stone tools with the advent of fire with the advent of domestication and so on like each of these qualitative step ups in the our ability to outcompete the rest of nature there was at each point the possibility of coming into a responsible equilibrium that necessitated taking some responsibility and exercising some kind of restraint so there are hunter-gatherer cultures who, and maybe some just still, still to this day, who really understood themselves as, among other things, as stewards of the land and caretakers of the land. Among some of the Native Americans, for example, the idea of the wild was a repulsive concept. Like, no, it's not the wild. We're, we're, here, we're here to interact. It wasn't that they left no trace. It was that they interacted in a positive way and left a positive trace. And there were those at each stage of our technological development that didn't take responsibility and did tremendous damage. So just to say that it's not an entirely a new thing that we're seeking here. There are precedents for it that operated on um, earlier levels of technological development. You know, if you can look at, at technology as kind of a st up, step up function where you had a sudden leap and then maybe a gradual increase and then another sudden leap and so forth. You know, there, so there were Stone Age cultures that lived in equilibrium. There were agrarian cultures that lived in equilibri equilibrium and maintained ecological symbiosis for thousands of years. And I'm not sure if we could say the same for industrial societies, let alone digital societies, but I'm just saying that there are precedents and cultural memories that we might be able to draw on as we forge a story that locates us in a different relationship to, to nature. 
Yeah, I think I think it's interesting because we're definitely not going backwards, right? We're moving to a society that is both higher touch and higher nature as well as higher tech, but a fundamentally different way of thinking about what technology is and, and, and what it's for. What it's for. Yeah. Um, and so any orientation to say it was good before, let's go back, we'll just lose. But there's a lot of principles that we've had in various previous phases that are actually a critical part of it. And so, you know, one one thing to what you said is that, of course, there was a distribution of cultures that were, say, more harmonious with their environment versus more exploitive, uh, less warring versus more warring. And in general, the way the curve goes is that the more warring cultures killed the less warring cultures at a certain point. And the ones that exploited the environments have been ended up taking over the ones that didn't at a certain point. And so we can see that it's like the only cultures that were kind of, that were more peaceful that were left for a while was if they didn't have natural resource, they weren't a threat. They were in some faraway place like Tibet until Tibet actually became a threat because you know, things like modern media where its message could damage the message of China to the rest of the world. And then it had to be taken out. And we could see that with patriarchal versus matriarchal cultures and, you know, Mm -hmm. Greece falling to Rome and all those types of things. And yet, so what we're, what we're looking at is in those phases doing the more power dominant thing, one, not doing it lost by default And so the power dominant thing both worked and was compulsory. Right. Now the power dominant thing has got to a high enough level of power that increasing the level of power on all sides is actually what is breaking the underlying substrate itself. And so it no longer can keep winning. The thing that has won so far, the winning in win lose itself is now the underlying threat to survival. And so when you say we need new tools, we actually need new meta tools. We need a meta process by which we aren't trying to create a situation that selects for us against others because that againstness itself will actually break the ability to even select for us. Mm-hmm. And so, of course, there have been lots of epochs with the agricultural revolution and industrial revolution, and there were major changes. But I would say the epoch that we are on the brink of that we're talking about now is like maybe the last time that something of this magnitude happened was homo habilis and tool making because, you know, we said like, okay, you've got evolution. It's a very old process, depending upon how we want to define it billions of years on this earth or as old as the universe. And that's a mathematical process that just kept happening for a very long time until tool making created a conscious central serial rather than unconscious decentral parallel creative process. And then there've been a lot of, epochal shifts in how we do the tool making thing, but we're really looking at a new third creative process that is neither evolution nor tool making. It's something that navigates the relationship between the both of them. It's a conscious right. creation of holes rather than an unconscious creation of holes or a conscious creation of parts. So I would say that that's kind of a meta epoch that we have not had a transition like that in the history of our species. That's very that's very yeah, interesting. I agree with that. I think that um, what we face is qualitatively different than any of the technological revolutions before. It's bigger than the Neolithic revolution. It's bigger than right. the Industrial Revolution. Because all of those were an intensification of something that was already in progress. Right. It was a, a next level of the development of the technologies of control. And this is something entirely different. It's a bigger and deeper qualitatively different kind of revolution than anything that we've had before. But every religion spoke to it or in the most part, most religions spoke to something like this with the, what is happening at the end of the Mayan calendar or the Mm -hmm. end of Kali Yuga and the emergence of Satya Yuga in the Hindu system or the, you know, the end of the end of times and purgatory and then heaven or hell. If we take these kind of metaphorically, we say, you know, let, let's just play with the idea that the rapture story in Christianity was just kind of like prescient people looking and saying, hey, as we went from stone tools to metal tools, and as we keep developing better and better tools, we're destroying environments faster than we were. There are deserts where there didn't used to be, and the wars are getting bigger. And they can just imagine that that doesn't get to go on forever. 
at a certain point, we become too powerful to keep being that dumb. And so there's the story that says this phase that we're in comes to an end. We fell out of the garden in terms of how to live in harmony with things. This phase comes to an end. There's a purgatory where there's some really hard reckoning with the choices we've made. And we either go a very different direction where we kind of are reintroduced to the garden, but at a higher order or it, or it's pretty bleak. Yeah. I think that's actually a literally true story. And we're just in purgatory now. We're actually in that eminent place mm-hmm. where the choices we've been making have to be not, not only do we have to shift them, we actually have to make amends. We have to do reparations on those choices, yeah. which is how do we actually clean the oceans, not just stop polluting them and fix the topsoil and those types of things. And so I think it is like, you know, people can get despairing or overwhelmed. They could also be like, this is the most interesting possible time to get to contribute to a deeper level shift of how for the future of all life than anyone has ever had the opportunity to contribute to. And to just be like, even if I don't know how to do it, I'm going to commit to do it before I know how and start increasing my understanding and sense making so I can more and more deeply engage. Right. We may not know the answers, but at least maybe we know the question. You know, we know the the direction we want to go. And I think you just named it. It is as reparations, you know, regeneration, healing. Um, what, I mean, this is the question I, I ask, you know, knowing that no species on earth is given superfluous or unnecessary gifts that don't contribute to the well-being and evolution of the whole. Um, the question is, well, what are our gifts for? And maybe for the next 500 years, they're for healing, the damage that's been done. After that, they're probably for something else that is unimaginable. And, and who knows, you know, why, why we're really here, why we really have this ability to, to forge exponential technology, to enact this new kind of evolution. Who knows why? But for the next few centuries, I think it's pretty clear what we're here for. And uh, for the time being, that's good enough for me. Yep. Agreed. So I think like we have, um, we got to a, a point, this is like maybe a good stopping point. You've really laid the foundation of here's what needs to happen. Here's the question to ask. You know, we can do this again and talk about more of, of the how to. I'll say one brief thing on the how to, just so that those who are really paying attention can be thinking about it. If the paperclip maximizer that we currently have is a, collective intelligence system that is working on humans as the processors, um, predisposing them in particular ways, etc. But it is a collective intelligence system that is oriented in a particular way and getting better. The answer is a new collective intelligence system that is oriented in a different direction, that is actually in service to evolution itself, increasing orderly complexity rather than paperclip maximizing. And yet that also has the ability to not just move in a direction, but increase its intelligence and and capacity to move in that direction. So we want to be thinking about how could we have a fundamentally different kind of collective intelligence, which is not just individual intelligence. How do we have humans interacting with each other in ways that produces system disposition that orients itself in the evolutionary direction Mm -hmm. and increases its capacity to do that. And yes, maybe we can have a future conversation where we dive into that more, but if people are thinking on it, that's a good area to be thinking in. Yeah. It would have a system component and a story component or a psychology component Mm -hmm. because the system creates the individual and the individual creates the system, you know, and like, like you can try to hold, a story of interbeing, you know, is the word I like to use for it. But we live in a system that every day in a million ways enforces separation. So it's really hard to live from interbeing. And we could have a system that invites us and supports us in being cooperative and transparent and so forth. So we can work on many, many levels. I think the systems level and the individual level. And that to me points to a convergence of activism and spirituality. Right. And I would say for people who want to figure out, okay, well, how do, how do I take these very macro topics and apply them to myself in the near term if, if I really care and I'm earnest? And I say, okay, well, there is a collective intelligence that is actually predisposing even my action. Facebook is 
moving me in a particular direction, capitalism and state and et cetera, actually have an influence on me. I want to evolve to where I can actually be part of an influence on the whole that is in a different direction. But in order to increase my ability to influence the whole in a positive direction, I also need to decrease the way the current system is influencing me and have things around me that are influencing me in a direction that I want. So how do I create collective intelligence that I'm a part of that is continuing to uh, support my own sovereignty and sense making and orient me in the right direction? And I would say the degree to which you can find people that are also really earnestly exploring these topics and not ones that all agree with you, but are earnestly exploring them. And you can create higher quality conversations with more regularity where the space that you are in is a space of earnest, high quality exploration across a diversity of points of view. You will be moved in the right direction better than if you leave the input to your brain largely to those who are doing broadcast media continuously trying to control the input to your brain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's uh, very attractive advice um, for me. Validates the direction I've been going. Of course, I could just be rebelling against my father or something in rejecting the uh, information that's that's being fed to me by the structures of power. But if so, so be it. <laughs> hey, I want to say um, briefly, people who are interested in this dialogue, you know, um, your Charles mentioned Lewis Mumford, and I'm sure he has a list on the site of recommended reading things that we've talked about today. You know, there's, I didn't come up with in really any of the ideas that I'm saying. I at most are kind of, in kind of synthesizing them, but there are ideas coming from Bucky Fuller and Barbara Marks Hubbard and Krishnamurti and David Bohm and, and others that are worth looking at. And specifically some of the, some of the structures regarding evolution as a creative process and then technology as a, creative process and that making an unstable oscillator and what the new process will be and uh, the distinctions between power and strength and have come largely that a lot of brilliant structures have come through uh, collaboration with a, a friend of mine named Forrest Landry. And he goes into those structures in a lot more formal detail in some of his writings. So I'd encourage anyone who's interested to look that up and um, that just a you know a little bit on resources and yeah if people are interested and questions come in and we get to do a future dialogue to explore those further that would be really fun yeah, and you said you had a, a blog or something like that and you have a podcast as well yeah civilizationemerging.com is a blog that I have and there's a podcast called Collective Insights and there's a couple different show hosts there's a really brilliant doctor who does a lot on the future of medicine named Dr. Heather Sanderson. And then I do some on these kind of social topics, which will include one posting soon where Charles was there sharing about climate change and polarization and the really fun conversation. Great. Okay. Yeah. We'll put links to those in our uh, blurb for this show. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, great. Daniel, thank you so much for uh, taking all this time. Likewise. Thanks for having me, Charles, and thank you for all the work that you are doing in helping people shift narrative and sense-making, and I look forward to continued collaboration. All right. This has been A New and Ancient Story with your host, Charles Eisenstein. I offer this podcast in the spirit of the gift, by which I mean that I don't withhold premium content for a price or put up paywalls or do affiliate marketing or have advertising or anything like that. Instead, I rely on supporters like you. If you would like to support it, you can subscribe at charleseisenstein.net for a small monthly amount, or you can subscribe for free as well. Either way, you get the same content, everything's the same, and you'll be notified every time a new podcast comes out. Also on the site, you can find archived episodes along with everything else that I produce, essays, books, videos, online courses. Thank you very much for listening, and I'll be with you again next time.